27. 26. 25 seconds. 24. 23 22 seconds Hi folks and welcome back to the Scotch Tracker. Today joining us is Star Trek author, blogger and podcaster Keith De Can how do you sorry, how do you say the surname? De Candido. De Candido, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so welcome welcome Keith and thanks very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Yes, thank you for being here. Happy and to be thanks here. Thanks for also uh, jumping on as uh, co host uh, Chris. Um, Keith, uh, I wondered um, what your earliest memories of Star Trek are. Oh boy, uh, my earliest memories of Star Trek would probably be being scared to death by the salt vampire in the Man Trap and uh, the big green fat guy in and the Children Shall Lead. Both of those uh, gave me nightmares as a kid. I um, I grew up uh, in this in in the nineteen seventies in New York City watching reruns of the original series. Um, one of the local stations here in New York, Channel 11, um, used to run Star Trek every weeknight at 6 o'clock. And my parents, who watched Star Trek originally on NBC when it first aired, um, continued to watch it in reruns with me uh, throughout my childhood. That was like, like we'd watch Star Trek at 6 and then eat dinner at 7. That was our, that was our routine on weeknights. And, um, and I grew up, you know absolutely devouring every episode. And, and the thing I remember most distinctly is being absolutely scared to death by the salt vampire and the big green fat guy. Um, I, I got over the, the both of those, um, although I still... I, I, can, I can watch The Man Trap without getting nightmares. I still get nightmares from In the Children Shall Leave, but not because of the big green fat guy. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's, horrible episode. Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. So uh, how did you start... Um, how did you get into writing Star Trek fiction? And um, it it literature. basically it was it was sort of uh, by by knowing the right people, but also by establishing myself as a writer. Um, I my my entry into the science fiction field as a professional um, happened when I started working for the late Byron Price. Uh, I was the science fiction editor for him, working as a he was a book packager, uh, and I edited a whole bunch of different science fiction projects. Um, and then I started writing professionally as well. I did a couple of short stories for some, some of the in-house projects we had with Byron and then did some novels for some other people. Uh, I did a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novelization, a couple of young Hercules novels, um, some short stories for Doctor Who for Magic the Gathering. And once I'd established uh, a decent-sized bibliography, John Ordover, who was uh, one of the two editors at Simon & Schuster who was handling Star Trek fiction, and who had known me for a bunch for almost ten years at that point, uh, going back to when he worked at Tor Books, uh, came to me and said, "Want to pitch me a Star Trek novel?" And I said, "Sure." Um, but he, I mean, even though John and I had been friends since 1990, it wasn't until 1999 that he that he made me that offer because I'd, I'd established myself uh, professional professionally as an author at that point. Um, I had done some freelance work for him, like some research and some other stuff for him here and there. Um, but I pitched a novel, he rejected it, <laughs> and, and then came back to me, like I said, this was in 99, he had just gotten the script in for uh, Deep Space Nine's What You Leave Behind. Mm, okay. And he said, hey, you're, you like Worf, right? I said, yeah, because um, he knew that Worf was one of my favorite characters. And he said, DS9 is gonna end with him becoming Federation ambassador to the Klingon Empire. How would you like to write the novel that does his first mission as, as a Federation diplomat. And I said, sounds great, let's do it. So John and I worked out the plot for Diplomatic Implausibility, which you can see the uh, painting of sort of behind me there. Um, it's a little glare, uh, but, but that's, uh, that's Sonia Helios' painting that, that went on the cover of that book. Uh, that was the first thing I was hired to do. I, uh, I did a couple things that came out before that, including a uh, comic book called Perchance to Dream, which came about when IDW got the license to do Star Trek fiction, and Jeff Marriott, who was the editor in charge of it, basically reached out to a bunch of people who had done Star Trek fiction uh, elsewhere. Uh, and a lot of the people who worked on IDW's uh, comics were also people who had uh, history writing prose. 
I had worked with Jeff before, um, with him as the writer and me as the editor uh, on a couple of projects for Byron Price back in the day. And um, and he asked me to pitch something, and I pitched for Chance to Dream, which wound up being um, the second miniseries they did, mostly because mine was the second one approved. <laughs> uh, I just lucked out in that regard. Uh, and then and then also John and I developed the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series, which debuted mm-hmm. in 2000. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that was that was that was a case where uh, Microsoft came to Simon and Trister and said, "Hey, we're debuting the MS Reader. We want to launch it with a new original Star Trek story that will only be exclusively available on the MS Reader." Uh, so John and I, over a weekend, basically, because this was a, a ridiculous rush project, um, we we came up with the the SCE, and we did three books. Dean Wesley Smith wrote one. I wrote one, and Christy Golden wrote one. Uh, and we launched the Starfleet Corps of Engineers series that way, and then continued it on for about six years after six seven years after that. Interesting. How did you? How do you find um, writing fiction for Star Trek, and then having to go or worrying about canon? Are there any strict rules about that? Um, fans worry about canon way more than uh, anybody who actually is responsible for creating the material does. Okay. Um, all. All canon is is a guideline to what you have to be consistent with. Um, the, the, we are obligated to be consistent with what is established on screen. We are welcome to include other things like, other, like you know, other works of fiction, comic books, role-playing games, whatever. Um, but it's not required that they be consistent with each other, and often they're not. Um, Sometimes they are, and it's great when, when that does happen, but it doesn't always. The only thing we have to be consistent with is what is established on screen. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes things will be established. I mean, constantly things have been established on screen that supersede stuff that was in the novels, starting with Star Trek, the mo- very first scene in Star Trek, the motion picture, which completely invalidated James Blish's novel, Spock Must Die. <laughs> uh, and, and that has continued throughout the years. Uh, from from the movie First Contact, negating the novel Federation by Judith and Garfield Reed Stevens, to the Next Generation episode Second Chances, negating a lot large chunks of Imzadi by Peter David, um, up to the current Picard series, which is mm-hmm. completely uh, wiped out twenty years worth of novel content. Yeah, which is uh, well, uh, frustrating. Know, well, uh, yes and no. I mean, the from from two thousand and Two, more or less. Um, from 2002 to, to, to when Picard debuted uh, a year ago, a um, year and a half ago, the only focus of on-screen Star Trek was in either the 22nd or 23rd century. Um, you know, the, the Enterprise and then the Bad Robot movies and then Discovery were all 22nd or 23rd century. The 24th century was not being touched by any of the mm-hmm. other versions of Star Trek, so we were free to, you know, well, you know, in the novels, we were we were free to do whatever we wanted. We decided to continue the story of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, uh, and some of the ancillary series we created, like Titan, um, continue them forward um, because there was nothing to contradict us until Picard and then Lower Decks. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know that that happens. Uh, that happened with with Doctor Who. You know, Doctor Who had a long hiatus. And nobody thought it would ever come back, and then it came back. Um, you know, it happened with Star Wars when they thought that hey, we're never gonna, you know, we're never going to do anything past Return of the Jedi until 2015 when they did. Mm-hmm. Well, right. You know, it, it 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 happens, and I don't stress about what's real in a fictional construct, um, because you know, yes, the novels are not canon. Neither is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and yet people still go watch those movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, uh, it's still there's no reason uh, to to negate what we're doing just because it doesn't fall, fit into mm-hmm. you know a, a perfect box or anything. Like I said, as long as it's uh, as long as they're telling good stories that work in the universe and that people enjoy. You know, we had we had a great time doing the uh, doing the, the the novel verse, as it were, of, of Star Trek in the twenty fourth century. It's going to be brought to a very nice conclusion. Uh, David Mack, James Swallow, and uh, Dayton Ward are going to be doing the Coda trilogy. Um, mm-hmm. While I'm not directly involved with it, I was in on some of the plotting sessions because uh, all three are good friends of mine, and, and 
we, yeah, we were all throwing ideas at each other and stuff, and and uh, uh, it's it's going to be really cool. And and it it gives the opportunity to because I mean the the one way or another that novel continuity was going to end because everything does. Um, at least we're being given a chance to or Bayer because I'm not really involved with it like I said, um, but the at least you know it's getting a chance to end on its own terms and and be given a proper ending, which not everything gets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a huge thing. As the final episode of uh, the next generation says and is called "All Good Things," must come to an end. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and for those that don't know, the Coda trilogy will be released later this year. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one question I was wondering was: Do you have a favorite aspect of writing uh, Star Trek or about Star Trek? Um. I just like writing in the universe. I mean, it's 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 a universe I've been watching liter almost literally since birth. So, um, and and it's one that I really enjoy. I like. I love the fact. I love the fact that Star Trek presents ultimately always an optimistic and compassionate future, particularly the compassionate part of it. Um, it's it's not a coincidence that most a lot of Star Trek episodes start with them answering a distress call, you know, basically going to help someone. And a hallmark of Star Trek from, um, you know, from, from the earliest days of the show, from, from things like the Corbomite Maneuver when, um, you know, they, they reach out to and help Balok when they think he's in trouble, even though he almost killed them, uh, to things like the Devil in the Dark, where you find out that the monster that killed all these people mm -hmm. is just a mother when you're young, all the way through to the most recent season of Discovery, where... The solution to the problem and, and the cause of, of the burn wasn't, you know, some malevolent force or anything. It was just basically a kid who lost his family, um, and and the way to solve the pro and the way to solve the problem is often with compassion rather than force. You know, reaching out to, um, and I'm blanking on the the, the Kelpian's name, but the the one Bill Bill Irwin played in Discovery, um, Sukal. Sukal, thank you. Reaching out to Sukal and showing him compassion is what solve the problem. You know, Odo reaching out to the founder and offering mm -hmm. to the link is what ended the Dominion War, not yep. a big yep. engagement. That, and that has consistently been true throughout Star Trek's history, and it's one of the things I like best about it. It's one of the things I, I really enjoy about working in that universe, is that is that it's about, be, it's about the compassionate solution rather than the violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, I noticed that oh, a lot of your... Yeah, characters <laughs> are really cool. Ah, oh, yeah. I've noticed in um, quite a few of the acknowledgements of the stories you've written, um, you've repeatedly thanked uh, Memory Alpha. So, oh, yeah. how have they helped? Um, sitting here in 2021, I wonder how in the 1990s I ever managed to write media tie in fiction without access to fan wikis. <laughs> we had to actually, like, do work to find out all this stuff. And not, I mean, I've worked in a lot of different. Uh, universes, and not every fan wiki is perfect, and not everyone is is, is comprehensive. But Memory Alpha is really good. Mm -hmm. um, it is very well put together. It is an incredibly valuable re uh, research tool. Um, and and the reason I've acknowledged them so often is because I and I still use them. I still use I still use Memory Alpha quite a lot when I'm writing my rewatch uh, articles for Tor.com. Um, and it's also occasionally helpful with with the reviews. Excuse me, the reviews that I write for uh, for the current shows. Also for tour, um, it's just it's it's incredibly valuable, and and not not every not every fandom is fortunate enough to have something as, as comprehensive as Memory Alpha for it, um, mm -hmm. but a lot do, and uh, and they're you know I, I I I did an Orphan Black book a few years ago. I've done a couple of Supernatural books, and in all those cases, the, the the fandom wikis have just been tremendously helpful. Uh, Alien also has a has a very good the Alien Predator uh, universe has a very uh, well put together. Wiki, um, and it's just it's just it's it's you know crowd crowdfunding research basically, um, or crowdsourcing research where you know people who are really dedicated to it you know providing the information for everybody to be able to use and it just makes everybody's life easier. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and at worst, it gives you a place to where where to look and where to find out you know the information you need about things. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's tremendously helpful, and it's it's been one of the best things about being a tie-in writer in the twenty-first century. <laughs> Having access to it. Yeah, 
So um, you mentioned like you were uh, fond of Worf and uh, your first story, first book was a Worf um, yes. story, basically. Um, I noticed you have written about Klingons uh, quite a few times, for example. Um, you wrote the book The Klingon Art of War, as well as creating the Ikeas Gorkin series of novels, I believe, yep. and writing the Alien Spotlights comic about Klingons. Uh, so I wondered what your opinion is of how the Klingons have been established in Star Trek Discovery. Uh, I'm fine with it. I, you know, I, I know a lot of people were complaining. I, I said something in 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 when I was reviewing Discovery's first season, um, talking about how uh, we've got uh, Star Trek in a format that you have to pay for instead of watching for free. You have the Klingons completely redesigned without any explanation whatsoever. The uniforms are different. The technology is different. Of course, I'm referring to 1979 when Star Trek The Motion Picture was released. Um, and <laughs> That's pretty good. That is actually very true. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and thank you, Tony Ann. Um, the, Tony Ann's a friend of mine, so she... Uh, and, and, and yes, nice. uh, it is good to see her here. Um, we, you know, this, this, this has happened before. Um, everybody, every time a new, uh, production company takes over or a new group of people take over doing, uh, Star Trek, they're going to want to put their own spin on it. Um, and I, you know, I'm fine with redesigning the Klingons. I think the cultural stuff they did was, was very interesting. Um, I particularly like the way that Shazad Latif and Mary Chifo played their Klingon characters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, both both uh, Vok and Lorel were, were incredibly fascinating characters. I really hope that we get to see more of Lorel on Strange New Worlds because um, mm. they they set up an interesting situation there that that is definitely worth exploring. Um, also, Mary, I've, I've I've been at a few conventions with Mary, and she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard that too, actually. About yeah, her. yeah, yeah, she's she's an absolute delight. And uh, so, uh, no, I'm I, like I said, I'm I'm fine with it. I think there's there's lots of there's lots of interesting stories to tell there, um, uh, and 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 there's still more to come. I mean, like I was one of the things that really got me, and I've I've, I've pitched this story both to. Simon and Trister and IDW and haven't gotten any traction with it. Um, and and I just realized, I was saying IDW before, when I was talking about Perchance to Dream and Jeff Marriott, that was Wildstorm, not IDW. Uh, I apologize. Uh, um, that was, that was uh, from 1999 to 2001. Uh, DC Comics reacquired the Star Trek license and they farmed it out to Wildstorm, which they, they had just purchased. Um, and and it, was, it was through them that I did Perchance to Dream. I apologize. Um, there have been like 914 comics companies that have had the Star Trek license. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, so, so it's easy. Malibu. Yeah, um, yeah. Marvel's had it twice. DC has had it twice. Uh, Gold Key, IDW, Tokyo Pop. You know. Um, yeah. Uh, and and I was actually working with Marvel at the time when when Marvel had it the second time when they did the whole Paramount Comics thing. Um, but uh, but anyway. Um, I would love to see jumping back to Discovery the 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 story about the time crystals on Boreth and and how that became part of uh, and 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 the people who caretake them who don't even answer to the High Council. It's like there's a story there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, just, and just in general, I think it did a good job of taking what was established and and establishing some new things. And and um, like I said, I was fine with it. There's there's still a lot to explore of Klingon culture. Mm -hmm. Did you have a? Did you have oh, a, sorry, did you go, have a question, Dan? Um, well, I noticed that you also penned a novel Q and A featuring the character of Q. So, how do you feel about him coming back in the second season of Star Trek: Picard? And have you, have you seen the trailer for that season? I have what seen the trailer. Yes, um, I I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there, it is. Uh, every time you put John Delancey as Q and Patrick Stewart as Picard together in a room, it is comedy gold. Um, <laughs> I think I, I think um, one of the reasons why Q's appearances on DS9 and Voyager did not work as well uh, is because he didn't have Patrick Stewart to play off of. For that matter, um, in in Q's second appearance in in Hide and Q, the scenes with Riker fell flat, but the scenes with Picard all sang beautifully, and they realized very quickly after that. Every time we saw Q on Next Generation, they paired him off with Picard, 
because that's the that's the team up that works. And and I tried mm. to and, and I was both well, when Peter David wrote his Q novels, when when Greg Cox wrote his Q Continuum trilogy, and when I wrote Q and A, all of us were 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 thinking in terms of keeping Picard and Q together as much as possible, because mm. that's that's where that's where the 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 that's where the music is, you know. Um, the two of them together are just magnificent. So, on that level, I'm looking forward to it. Um, again, it's probably going to invalidate everything I established in Q and A, um, where I basically tied together all of Q's previous appearances. But maybe it won't. Who knows? Um, and and whether it does or not, I'm fine with it. I'm I, I'm looking forward to seeing that pairing again. So. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Chris, you had the question. Well, I was just going to ask, actually, talking about Q, how do you, what is your process like when you're writing for Star Trek and you have different characters and trying to find the correct voice, I guess, if you will? Um, I, what, sitting and watching the, uh, the material. I mean, the, the, there is no substitute for, for direct research. Um, you know, when I, when I, whenever I'm doing, and this is true of any tie-in project that I do, um, I sit down, even if it's something I know really well, like Star Trek or, or like Farscape or Leverage or, or, or Orphan Black, where, where I was already a fan of it before I started writing for it, um, I still sit down and watch it again with, with an eye, with an ear, really, toward paying attention to how the characters talk, what their word choices are, what their mannerisms are, and so I can try to recreate that in prose. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, making sure I, I get how... How they talk, you know. I there was. I, I love mentioning this in particular because it's an example of, of how the process can work. Um, I wrote uh, a novella that was published as an ebook. It was part of the Slings and Arrows miniseries that we did, which was basically the first year of the Enterprise E's uh, service before First Contact. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, right. And, and dealing with certain things like you know why LaForge switched from the visor to the bionic implants, uh, how Data learned to turn off his emotion chip. Um, and, and also how the Enterprise dealt with certain things that were established on Deep Space Nine at the time, like um, martial law being declared on Earth and Homefront Paradise Lost, um, Waxana Troy being pregnant, which was which was established in the Muse, and um, and just in general the whole thing with with uh, the the build up toward the Dominion War as well as the rise of the Maquis. And mm-hmm. as part of that, I did a story called Enterprises of Great Pitch and Moment, which was actually a Next Generation Deep Space Nine team up, which put Picard and Cisco together. Oh, uh, awesome. You asked about one of the things you, you, that, yeah. that's fun yeah. to do uh, in tie-in fiction. One of the other things that's fun to do when you're writing Star Trek fiction is you are not constrained by actor availability. Mm-hmm. You can put yeah. characters together regardless of whether or not the actor is available or not, or in some cases if the actor is dead. Um, you know, and, and that that level of free being able to put Picard and Cisco together, because they've never really teamed up since DS9's pilot, and there's a lot of stuff there. You know, uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot yeah. of emotional yeah. On both their parts, because of what happened at Wolf Three Five Nine. So, and and when I had them talking, and there was a line of dialogue that I had originally given to Picard, and I realized that no, this is a line that Cisco has to have. And even though both sent both sentences were saying the same thing, I completely rewrote it because Avery Brooks doesn't talk the way Patrick Stewart does. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't just say Cisco said instead of Picard said. The way the question, the way the sentence was phrased, had to be completely redone because of who was saying it. And I try to be conscious of that every time. Um, about uh, 15 years ago, I did uh, a workshop on writing tie-in fiction. And one of the exercises I gave to the students was to take Kirk's "Risk is our business" speech, mm, right? Yeah. Episode. I said, rewrite this speech if one of the other Star Trek captains was giving it. You can pick mm. the captain: Picard, Cisco, Janeway, Archer. Um, I even let them pick like one of the literary captains. Like I think one person picked Calhoun from the New Frontier series. Um, another one picked Captain Gold from the Corps of Engineers. Any of them just have have it be, you know, one of the other captains. How they would give that exact same speech. My favorite was mm-hmm. one who had Janeway do it and instead and specifically had her citing Leonardo da Vinci. And if they, if man had meant to fly, he'd have made wings. And she mentioned because she's a da Vinci fan. So that was a nice <laughs> stuff like yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly about that when you're when you're working on it how how the characters talk what their turns of phrase are things like that mm-hmm. okay so do you think it cool. can, do you think it can sort of like work too much the other way where um like lines are being copied too much um i mean as long as, 
It can be. The, the idea is to sound like what they're supposed to sound like, not necessarily repeat exact phrases. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some friends that... Obviously, not but, in but, Star Trek, yeah. but in other franchises, I've found that can be a, um, a risk, sort of. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a question coming uh, from Danny. Um, if there's a... I mean, yes. I, I mean, I've done a lot of different genres. Most of what I write is science fiction and fantasy, yes. Um, I have... Uh, I've written... Just recently, I, I had two collaborative novels. One was a military, a very hard military science fiction uh, novel mm -hmm. called Pellet Group, which was very a very different experience. Uh, I wrote a thriller uh, called Animal with a uh, collaboration with Dr. Manish K. Batra. And um, that was that was also it was a serial killer novel, which was very different from my usual, um, which was which was part of the fun. I, you know, I love writing mysteries. I've done mysteries in science fiction and fantasy settings, but I would love to write a straight up mystery at some point. Um, you know, I, 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 I like telling interesting stories about interesting people. The genre doesn't matter as much. I tend toward fantasy and science fiction just because that's what I like um, and because I seem to be good at it, or at least people keep telling me I'm good at it, so I could be lying. But but I keep getting paid, so I'm not going to complain. Um, but that's that's what I tend to like doing. But there's, there's lots of genres I love to work in. And one of the fun things about fantasy and science fiction in particular is you can mix it with other genres. Um, mm -hmm. Most... Genres are genres of plot, romance, mystery, horror, thriller. All of those are, are plot genres. But science fiction and fantasy is a genre of setting. What makes it science fiction and fantasy is where it takes place, not what the story is. So you can plug another genre in very easily. You can do a horror novel that's in a science fiction mm -hmm. setting, do a mystery that's in a science fiction setting. You, know, you can do all that stuff, uh, which, which makes it fun to, to you know, mix the chocolate and the peanut butter, as it were. So. And what, what, I was just wondering there, what, what would you say is the difference between science fiction and fantasy? How would you word that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they, they overlap a lot. I mean, in both cases, it's, it's, a, it's a case where the setting isn't real. Um, science fiction tends toward more, well, it's right there in the word, and more science-based things or time-based, you know, where you're basically moving forward in time. It's, it's, mm. uh, it's, it's, it's the present day, but in the, it's, it's not the present day, it's in the future. and It's what the future is going to look like. Or there is some sort of scientific advancement that, that has changed things, you know, um, even if it's in the present. Um, you know, or, or alternate history where you're, you're, you're extrapolating history from a, from a change in, in the timeline. Fantasy tends to be more fantastical, like it says in the name, you know, where, where it will involve supernatural forces or magic or something like that. That's really the only difference, and and like I said, the Venn diagrams overlap a lot. Um, mm. So, cool. Uh, I had a question from uh, one of my friends, Bill Williams, who asked, um, "Do you plan to return to the Star Trek universe any time down the road?" I'd love to. It's not up to me. Um, I, you know, I, I, I never wanted to stop in the first place. Uh, but there was a change in editors at Simon and Schuster, and the new editors weren't interested in hiring me, and they're still there. So um, that could change. Um, you know, I've, I've reached out a few times, but nothing, nothing has come of it. Um, this happens all the time. Every time there's an editorial change at Simon and Schuster, there are writers who get left out in the cold. It's happened every single time, um, and will continue to happen again. Um, um, I would love it if it changed back. <laughs> uh, I miss writing Star Trek quite a bit, but... Uh, yeah, but it's like I said, it's not up to me. And it's there's plenty of there's plenty of good people writing Star Trek fiction right now, um, and you know I'm not. Yeah, they're, they're, I don't think they're really. I, I'm I'm losing more by not writing it than the readers are. I think. Um, but uh, I mean, I, like I said, I miss writing in the universe. But uh, and I've also got plenty to keep me busy too. So, so I mean, like I said, more... if the opportunity presents itself, I will absolutely jump at it. <laughs> mm. But so as, would you be more interested in writing Star Trek fiction than nonfiction? I like both. I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I probably will continue to write, um, write about Trek for for Tor.com. I've pretty much become their Star Trek go-to guy over the last ten years. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I, and honestly, even when I was writing fiction, I was doing Star Trek nonfiction too. I was writing articles regularly for the Star Trek magazine and and, and other sources. Um, you know, I love I love writing about Star Trek, and I love writing for Star Trek, and and I hope to continue to do so for a very long time. I've been I've so, I've been 
I've been writing about or for Star Trek for since 1999. Um, oh, so that's oh. 22 years now. <laughs> I don't particularly want to stop. So uh, Danny asked, like, what's your favorite track to write? Like, do you have a, a series <laughs> that you prefer to write for? Honestly, the one I, I it's it's going to be self, very self-aggrandizing. But the the ones I enjoyed the writing the most were the two I was responsible for creating or co-creating, which were the IKS Gordon mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Starfleet Corps of Engineers. Um, with with the Gorkon books, what was just amazing to me was, I mean, I only did, um, I did four full novels plus. I mean, there were the the Gorkon crew was a supporting cast in um, in Diplomatic Implausibility, and then we spun them out to their own thing. They were they were part of they were part of the Brave and the Bold series, and then I did four, uh, three IKS Gorkon novels, one Klingon Empire novel. And then they also appeared in A Singular Destiny in a small role, and um, every time I wrote. Clag and his crew. The the words just came effortlessly. Um, Enemy territory, the third book in the series. I wrote that book in like three weeks, and it wasn't because I was on a tight deadline. It just the the words just came <laughs> pouring out in that book. Uh, it just I found them really easy to. I became really invested in those characters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, and and. With, with the Corps of Engineers, I was the editor in charge of the monthly series. Um, so I was kind of the executive producer of the Starfleet Corps of Engineers TV show that we weren't doing. <laughs> and, uh, but but I, was, I was coordinating everything with the writers, and I was writing some of them and stuff. You know, and it really was very much like a writer's room uh, for a TV show with, with me as the showrunner. Um, and there was a really good, strong, collaborative feel among myself, Dave Morden, Kevin Dillmore, David Mack, Christopher Bennett. Uh, Aaron Rosenberg, Glenn Howman, Ilsa Bick, uh, Phaedra Weldon, Kevin Kiliani, Will William Leisner, Terry Osborne. All of us were like throwing ideas at each other and, and talking. You know, we were like in communication with each other and throwing things back and forth at each other and building on each other's stories. Um, mm. You know, uh, there were there were different things that were done with with Dr. Elizabeth Lenz that Ilsa would tie tied together into into her story, a story she did with her. Um, uh, there was there was you know little things like a throwaway bit that, that Ian Edgerton and Mike Collins did in their story about Gold's granddaughter dating a Klingon, which built into this whole thing where we devoted an entire two book series to the first ever Klingon Jewish wedding, um, in creative couplings that Glenn Hellman and Aaron Rosenberg did, and uh, and it just you know it was just such a wonderful creative experience of, of a bunch of writers you know building on each other's stories. And creating some really neat stories with a wonderful bunch of crew. I loved the SCE. I loved the the. It was it was it was in some ways exactly like a Star Trek crew, and in some ways completely unlike any other Star Trek crew. You know, because uh, the, the anal uh, one of the analogies I used was to the Mash, uh, the, the TV mm. show about yeah. doctors, yeah. or not so much for the medical part, but because a Mash unit is has a bunch of people who are not regular army. They're specialists, in this case, doctors, or in our case, engineers. Um, but it's it's the same thing where it's people who are not your standard spit and polished Starfleet types. They're they're specialists in their field, they're engineers, and they, they think a little differently. And they don't they're not gonna be like your regular officers. Um, and and that was I mean that's why we, we patterned Captain Gold after Colonel Potter on that show, Harry Morgan's character. Um, and uh, and it was just it was it was so much fun to do that series. I still I've been I've been reading. I, I started up uh, when the apocalypse happened last year. <laughs> um, I started up a YouTube channel called Crad COVID Readings, and um, I I was, loving that. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been reading all my short fiction. What I've been specifically doing this year is reading my Starfleet Corps of Engineers stories, and it's been tremendous fun to revisit that. You know, I'm just I'm just reading the ones I wrote, but I've also been like reading the other ones that came between them and stuff just to get back into the series. And it's just it's. That was so much fun to do. Uh, mm. you know, if 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 I ever had the opportunity to pick up and do more Corps of Engineers stories, I would absolutely jump at it. Um, mm. I, I mean, we'd have to completely like start it over from scratch and probably do it like at, you know set in the same period time period as Picard or something. But, uh, but it would still be fun. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, so um, um, sorry, Chris, sorry, Chris. Uh, uh, you have a, a question. question. Yeah, I was just going yeah. to ask, are there any characters that you would love to write a story about that you haven't had a chance to? Ooh, good um, most of the, um, honestly, the 
a lot of the Discovery crew, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, basically most of the characters in the new shows, I haven't had a chance, aside from Picard and Seven of... Actually, no, I've never written Seven of Nine. So aside from Picard, <laughs> uh, and now Q, uh, I haven't written any of them. Um, uh, probably, honestly, the the of the new characters who've been introduced, the ones I would be most interested in writing are from Discovery, uh, Saru, mm-hmm. who I think... Yeah. Yeah. Saru is really good. I love Saru. Um, and, and Doug Jones plays him so well. Also, Tilly, um, who's, yeah. uh, who actually would be completely, uh, fit in perfectly on, a, on an SCE ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Those, those two in particular from Discovery. And, um, I also would love, would kill to write, um, Kestrin, Riker and Troy's daughter. Mm-hmm. I absolutely would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was I, great. I, she was she was a fantastic character, um, and and I would love to 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 write some more of her, and I hope we get to see more of her. Uh, either either, well, I don't, I don't think she was born yet uh, when Lower Decks takes place, but um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, that, that because Lower Decks is like right after Nemesis, but uh, uh, but see, I would love to see more of her on Picard, and I and I hope we get to. So uh, I was wondering about um, Tor.com. Uh, so I understand you're uh, currently like reviewing Voyager. Will you be yes. uh, reviewing like Enterprise after? Or kind of have to. Like? I uh, it, it, it like so I did. The the it, it started when they just finished an original series rewatch that was originally done by two writers who then who then quit after season two. David Mack and Dayton Ward took over doing season three for it. Um, it was uh, Eugene Myers and Troy Atkinson did the first two seasons, and then they went off to do something else. So Dave and Dave and Dayton did season three. They didn't really have the where the the time to do Next Generation, especially because it was going to have to be twice a week in order to get it done in a reasonable amount of time. They recommended me, um, and it the Next Generation rewatch I did was incredibly popular uh, and very well received by by the by Tor's readers. So it was a no brainer to then do DS Nine after that. But I didn't particularly want to do Voyager. I, and so I said, can I do the original series? I know, you know, it was done before, but that was years ago. And, you know, that was like five years ago. That's forever in internet time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they said, sure. So I did the original series. And I also covered the animated series and the movies as well. Um, and then it was like, okay, I, re- I still don't want to do Voyager. And I wound up doing my superhero movie rewatch. When, when my superhero movie rewatch was winding down because I had caught up to real time, as it were, I was, I was reviewing the 2019 movies uh, and there weren't any new ones for a bit. Uh, I was looking to see what else I could be doing for them. And I was thinking about it. We, we, we had just come into the 2020 new year and it was before 2020 became what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there were several factors that led me to reconsider my decision to, to not do Voyager. Uh, one was 2020 was the 25th anniversary of the show. Um, and, and in fact, I started it in January, which was the actual 25th anniversary of, of, of when it launched. And I, like I said, I, I never really was able to get my arms around Voyager. I, I didn't like it as much as I did the previous three shows. Um, but a lot of people um, whose opinions I respect tremendously had basically told me I should give Voyager another chance. Um, and... In particular, uh, a lot of women who grew up watching Voyager and for whom Janeway was their hero, was their hero, um, and that's 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 worth something. And so I figured, all right, let me do this. Let let's let's do that. And then since I was doing Voyager, and since I've been reviewing all the new shows uh, for Tor.com as well, it seems silly to not do Enterprise at that point because it's like it's like having a gap tooth smile, you know. If I'm gonna do gonna rewatches of every other previous show and reviews of all the new shows, Enterprise can't just sit there by itself. So, so yes, when I once I get to Endgame, uh, I'm gonna jump in and do Broken Bow, and I'm gonna cover all four seasons of Enterprise. Um, I'm probably also gonna contrive a way because I, I I covered um, of the four Next Generation movies, I covered two of them. Because when we finished Next Generation, we sort of traded off doing the movies. Uh, Emmett Asher Perrin did Generations. Uh, Brian Britt did uh, Insurrection. Uh, Chris Loft did uh, Nemesis. I did First Contact. I later covered Generations in my original series rewatch, but I've never actually written about Insurrection and Nemesis. I really should. <laughs> Just complete the set, as it were. So somewhere in there, I'm going to do that. Um, 
I might do it like around when the next season of Picard debuts. I may do it between Voyager and Enterprise. I haven't decided yet. Um, but uh, but the idea is is to then cover Enterprise, and then after that we'll see what happens. I uh, but I'm I'm still going to continue reviewing the new shows. I'm going to review Prodigy when it comes out. I'm going to review. You know, Discovery season four and Stranger World season one and Picard season two and, and Lower Deck season two as they come out. So uh, that's that's all in the hopper, as it were. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm especially looking forward to, to Prodigy. Um, I have heard nothing but good things about it. Um, I, I have one friend who 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 is Kate Mulgrew's uh, uh, social media manager mm. is, is a friend of mine, and she, I've been hearing a lot from her about how excited Mulgrew is to be working on the show. Uh, and David Mack is one of the consultants on the show, and and Dave has been effusive in his praise. And Dave does Dave is not effusive yeah. very often. <laughs> yeah. So so the fact that he uh, he really has been just completely singing the praises of, of, of the showrunners and of their approach to Star Trek, and and how my, how good this show is going to be, and and I'm really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. that's amazing. I may have a new set of characters I want to write about once. This oh, very cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have a when you're doing a rewatch? Do you have a like a specific process that you use for all of your rewatches? Uh, I watch the episode and then I write about it. It's not that, I mean, okay. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Uh, I, I when I, when I first started doing them in 2011, one of the things I wanted to do is is the format which I completely stole from uh, three British writers, uh, Paul Cornell, uh, Keith Topping, and Martin Day, who did a bunch of. Um, uh, unofficial guides to various TV shows. They did Doctor Who, they did Star, mm-hmm. Star Trek, uh, they did uh, The X-Files and some others. And they broke it, They broke each thing down into categories, most of them with funny titles. I totally mm-hmm. stole that. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah. I love that, yeah. Uh, and Because I, I thought that was a good way to do it. It, it, it breaks things up a little bit and, and makes it uh, easier to read um, and, and more fun for me to write too. Um, you know, coming up with the different things, and it allows you to focus on on certain characters and, and what happens with them, um, and and also having a spe- separate trivial matter section is especially fun for me because I love all that stuff. I love finding all the weird background stuff and and, and weird things. So, you know, some episodes are better for it than others, but uh, God, the Star Trek movies. I think I think the 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 especially the original series movies. I think the trivial matter sections were like the longest parts of. Them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 I was just remembering oh, yeah. the, like those that you were speaking about. I think it was called like um, the the New Voyagers or something like that. And it, it was just after DS Nine started. And I remember it, it categorized the the sections yes. similarly. Uh, yeah, I did. I also did that. I did a. Uh, I contributed to the first uh, of the Watchers guides for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which covered the first two seasons, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was basically brought in at the last minute because Chris, Christopher Golden and Nancy Holder were running late with it. And so they needed someone to do the character profiles and the episode guide. So when I did the episode guide, I also broke it down into categories. My, my one regret, uh, Fox nixed one of my categories, which was Giles' cranial trauma, which was basically every time Giles got hit in the head in an episode, I would chronicle it. They didn't like that. So even though you got hit on that constantly. <laughs> So, uh, are there any projects you're currently working on that you'd like to promote? Oh, a few. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, my 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 latest books. Uh, I have one that came out last fall. I mentioned uh, the military science fiction I did uh, called Tell Henry Group. It's actually the third book in a trilogy by David Sherman. Uh, for various and sundry health reasons, David was unable to finish book three. I edited books one and two when they first came out. Uh, issue and doubt in all directions. And then, so when, when David was unable to finish book three, he asked me, as the person who worked with him on the first two as, as editor, to complete the book that he had started. Um, it, the whole trilogy is available in an omnibus called The 18th Race, uh, which is out for me, Spec Books. There's Animal, which I wrote with uh, Dr. Munish K. Batra, which is a, uh, about a serial killer who specifically targets people who harm animals. Um, it's kind of like Dexter if, uh, if it was created by PETA. Um, okay. And uh, it's it's a thriller that's out from Wordfire Press. It's been out since January. Um, and then my latest book is uh, part of a series called Systema Paradoxa, which is a series of uh, books that are about cryptids, you know, bit, bit different monsters from folklore. Uh, mm-hmm. I particularly did the Jersey Devil, which is a, a monster uh, that, that goes back to colonial times in New Jersey, and particularly got popularized in 1909 
when in January of that year there were multiple sightings of this weird creature um, that looked like sort of a cross between a dragon and a kangaroo. Um, like, like for this whole week in, in central New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania, there were all these sightings of the Jersey Devil. So I did a story that takes place partly in present day, partly in January 1909, and partly back in the 1700s, the secret origin of the Jersey, of the Jersey Devil. Uh, it's called oh, All the Way Out, and that's coming out, uh, I think it's coming out very soon uh, from East Bay Books. You can pre-order it now, and it, it'll be available sometime uh, between now and the end of the month. Um, I've got a couple of projects that I can't talk about yet. Uh, okay. One is a comic book that ties into, uh, it's, it's a tie-in comic book uh, that I'm just starting the script on and we're hoping to have out in the next couple months, um, which will be very fun to do. Uh, it's it's a it's a world I've worked in before, which doesn't narrow it down because I've worked in like thirty five different worlds. But um, uh, it's not Star Trek, I can say that much. Um, and another one that's uh, still in the development stages. It's uh, some develop some novellas based on a uh, on a game. Um, I'm hoping I've got some proposals out for various things. I'm going to be working on the next book in my urban fantasy series. Uh, the first book was called A Furnace Sealed. It's about a guy from the Bronx who hunts monsters for a living. The second book is called Feet of Clay, which uh, I'm working on right now. Um, and uh, some other stuff. Oh, the next book in my precinct series of fantasy police procedurals, the kind of law and order meets Lord of the Rings. Okay. Uh, I've, done, I've done five novels, uh, starting with Dragon Precinct. Uh, the latest will be F Phoenix Precinct, which I'm hoping to have out at the beginning of 2022. Um, and and uh, I should mention this, because there's only like a day left in the Kickstarter. Uh, my wife and I just started up a very small press called Whisperwood. Uh, and our first project is an anthology called The Four Somethings of the Apocalypse. Uh, it's alternate takes on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So it's like the four cats of the apocalypse, the four lawyers of the apocalypse, the four PTA moms of the apocalypse, the four development executives of the apocalypse. Um, we've, we've well exceeded our funding goal. Um, but it's, it's up on Kickstarter right now. If you go to my website at decendido.net, there's a link to it there. Um, and uh, it's got uh, several Star Trek authors uh, are involved, including David Mack, Peter David, Michael Van Friedman, Robert Greenberger, Aaron Rosenberg, Derek Tyler Attico, um, David Gerald, uh, the guy the guy who wrote The mm -hmm. Trouble with Tribbles is, is doing a story. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also got Shauna McGuire, Jonathan Mayberry, uh, Jody Lynn Nye, uh, Mary Fan, Daniel Ackley McPhail, uh, Laura Ann Gilman, um, Gail Z. Martin, uh, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, a lot, a lot of cool people contributing to it, um, uh, and and it, you should definitely check that out. And if if you don't make it, to, if you don't support the Kickstarter, the book itself should be out this fall. We're hoping to have it out in time for Dragon Con. Oh, cool, uh, uh, Chris. Do you have any more questions? Um, do you yeah. ever just talking about your rewatches? Do you ever find having to do a rewatch uh, maybe impacts the enjoyment of the episode? Or the series um, that you're watching? Really? Um, it. I mean, I, it, it's been interesting because I, things have come up that I did not expect, um, which is which is fascinating to me, um, and 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 assumptions that I made that I that that people have about it that 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 don't actually work out. Um, mm. For example, the the whole notion of. Uh, Kirk being a maverick who goes his own way and thumbs his nose and orders is completely an artifact of the movie, specifically the third movie. On right, it. yeah, I remember you saying that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the series, he followed orders very routinely. Uh, the only time he really broke broke with protocol was in a muck time when, when Spock's life was at stake. And arguably in the Doomsday Machine, but that's because the orders he was being given was, was by a guy who was completely binky bonkers. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, but But and, and then same thing in, in the search for Spock. It was specifically because it was to save Spock. That was why he disobeyed Orton. Then all of a sudden, that became the book on Kirk, even though that contravenes the entire point. The whole point of Star Trek Three was that it was an unusual occurrence. Um, so there was that. I came out of my Next Generation rewatch actually intensely disliking the character of Geordi LaForge, which I feel bad about because LeVar Burton is awesome. But, but um, yeah, but there's... Then, there's some stuff with LaForge that has, that has not aged well. And like actually... The booby but, trap situation? Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and especially Galaxy's Child. Um, right, yeah. Uh, the, I appreciate the character of William Riker more than I did the first time I watched the show. I appreciate the character of Chakotay more than I did when I first watched the show. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, watching Voyager in particular, 
um, when given good material, which didn't happen all that often, Robert Beltran was really good. The problem is when he wasn't given good material, he just sort of was, you know, a piece of wood on the bridge. Um, but, and it didn't help. And, and this was something that, that, that wasn't entirely known at the time. The, 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 the guy who advised them on indigenous matters was a fake Indian uh, who went by the name Janaki Highwater and who was really a Jew from Los Angeles named Jackie Marks, who was a, comp a total con artist and, and didn't have any real knowledge of, of indigenous culture, which was unfortunate. Um, I thought he was Greek or something. Uh, maybe he was Greek. I thought he was Joe. Either way, not native, which was the important right, yeah. part. <laughs> And uh, and and because he was their consultant, that just and it just that just made it worse. But there were there's there's several episodes where Chakotay was given a focus. That he was really good in the episode. Yeah, no, he yeah. has good stuff for sure. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, I mean, some things were as I expected. You know, uh, Patrick Stewart is awesome. Michael Gordon is awesome. Jerry Ryan is awesome. You know, uh, pretty much the entire Deep Space Nine crew is awesome. Um, I did uh, also watching DS Nine. The the there were certain indulgences that really got tiresome in the latter seasons of DS9. Um, so much of the rest of the show was awesome that, that, that it covered for that. Uh, but we really didn't need as much Vic Fontaine as we got. Mm, okay, right. Yeah, there was a lot of Vic Fontaine in the uh, yeah. last two seasons. Yeah. yeah. Um, I thought the same. Yeah. Uh, and, and, a few other, and there were a few other issues. But overall, no, I, it's actually given me a greater appreciation of all the shows I've and, and, you know, when I did my superhero movie rewatch, same thing. I found some gems, some absolutely wonderful movies that I didn't even know about. There were Dick Tracy movies in the 1940s. I had no idea. Um, you know, and, and, and other cool stuff. It's, it's been great. It, it, it's, it, it's absolutely enhanced the experience overall. So. Yeah. So uh, um, I certainly think that uh, it's been great to speak with you today and it's certainly um, enhanced the experience of... Uh, enjoying your your books though i look forward mm -hmm. to reading um so thank you very much for coming on there, there are a bunch of pleasure here. to speak with you yes it's been a treat to be able thank to you. speak with you I, I i i do want to do one last plug for, uh if you go to my website at decendido.net which is my last name there it is my last name mm -hmm. um that links to my social media presence where i'm fairly active it also links to my patreon uh, where I do TV reviews, movie reviews, excerpts from my works in progress, uh, vignettes featuring my original characters, which I've been enjoying tremendously, and also cat pictures, which is which is very important. Uh, cool. So, no, uh, awesome. and, and there's the YouTube channel that I mentioned earlier, where where I re I've read most of my short fiction and I'm currently going through my Starfleet Corps of Engineers uh, stories. Uh, right now, I'm going through War Stories Book One, which is flashbacks to the Dominion War. Um, mm. And uh, and I'm I'm active on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, and obviously on Tor.com. So. Cool. So it's it's been great to speak with you. Thank you. Um, to our viewers, please like and subscribe uh, to the video, and we'll see you next time. Uh, join us next Saturday. Um, uh, thank you for watching. Whenever you're watching, because I know some people may watch this after we're live. But thank you, guys. Um, thank you everyone thank you chris and to keith bye. bye take care stay safe